Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is just going to be some case updates over different cases that I've covered over the course of this channel. Now, if you're a part of the Patreon family, then you already know about a couple of these updates. Anytime there's a case update to share, Patreon is where I post it first so that we can all keep up to date with everything that's going on in these cases and have discussions about them. So if you wanna be one of the first to know when a case update comes out, make sure to go ahead and join my Patreon. There is my shameless Patreon plug for the day. Also, I will be linking all of the original videos that I made about each case update. That way, if you need a refresher, you can go ahead and watch that video first. That way, all of these updates make sense to you. But with that being said, let's get into these updates. The first update that I have is one that has been absolutely flooded in my comments, and it has to do with the Murdoch case. So just for a refresher, Mallory Beach was friends with a guy named Paul Murdoch, who drove a boat completely obliterated by alcohol and the boat crashed and Mallory lost her life. And Paul didn't really have to face many consequences, at least immediately after, probably due to his family's high political status in South Carolina. But even beyond being connected to Mallory's death, there's a couple of other deaths from other people that he may be connected to. This is a case that I highly suggest you go and watch if you're not familiar with it, because there's just so many layers to this case. There's just so much to go over. So make sure you go ahead and watch the other video if you don't quite remember the details. But either way, several months after Mallory's death and just a few months ago, Paul Murdoch and his mother, Maddie Murdoch, were actually shot and killed near their property. Many people have speculated that this has something to do with Mallory's death, or maybe it had something to do with the other deaths that he was connected to, or maybe it was something completely unrelated. No matter what theory you believe, Leave, this case just keeps getting crazier and crazier. So about three months after his wife and son were shot and killed just a few days ago, 53-year-old Alex Murdoch, so again the father of Paul Murdoch, has been shot in the head. So apparently Alex Murdoch was on the side of the road changing a tire in his car when a truck passed him and then it turned back around to pass him again and then the person in the truck opened fire and shot him in the head. And this was in broad daylight and Alex called 911 himself to report the shooting at 1.43 p.m. to report that he had been shot in the head on Old Sol Calci Road near Varnville, South Carolina. He was then airlifted and flown to Memorial Health University Center in Savannah, Georgia for a superficial gunshot wound to the head. So he has survived this gunshot wound this far and he is still in the hospital recovering. A family spokesperson came out and said that they do expect him to make a full recovery and there aren't any suspects in this case right now now and no motive has been released. So that's pretty much all of the information that's been released on this specific update, but I actually got an email the other day on a statement that he made. So I'm gonna go ahead and read that off my phone. So I apologize if I'm looking down, but from the hospital, Alex said, quote, the murders of my wife and son have caused an incredibly difficult time in my life. I've made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. I'm resigning from my law firm and entering rehab after a long battle that's been exacerbated by these murders. I'm immensely sorry to everyone I've hurt, including my family, friends, and colleagues. I ask for prayers as I rehabilitate myself and my relationships. So that's kind of saying a lot to me. Um, I think he recognizes the people that he's hurt to me. I think that he knows that there's probably more going on and honestly that statement to me almost makes me think that he maybe knows who did this or has an idea or has a suspicion of who may have done this. I don't know what do you guys think about this so far it's absolutely insane that this is happening and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys think because I honestly have no idea what to think of this. But either way, again, that's pretty much all the information that's been released on this. I imagine that there's a lot more that's going to be coming out about this in the coming weeks or months. So I will be doing my best to keep everybody updated on this. But again, I do post most updates to my Patreon or my Twitter. So if you want to keep up to date with that, at least go ahead and follow my Twitter so that you can get all these small updates as they're coming out. So the 
next updates are a little bit older and I actually did record an entire other video for these updates, but there was a problem with my mic. So I ended up not even posting it because the audio was just absolutely horrible and it's taken me a while to be able to get the time to re-record this. So here's to my second attempt at recording these case updates. So next case update has to do with Heidi Furkus. Many of you may have seen this because I did post about it on Twitter and my community tab as well as to my Patreons, of course. But if you haven't, Nick Furkus, Heidi's then husband, has been arrested for her murder 11 years after her death. Again, if you don't remember this case, I will have it linked below and I will put it in the cards in the corner. And again, I won't get into specifics in this case, but here is just a quick reminder. So basically, Heidi called 911 one morning to report a robbery in her house. She hung up shortly after making this call, but before she hung up, the dispatcher heard someone screaming no on the line. A few minutes later, Nick Furkus called police again to tell them that someone had broken into their house and shot the both of them. When police arrived to the home, they saw that Heidi had been shot in the back after she was allegedly running away from the intruder and saw that Nick was shot in the arm. Nick's story was that he confronted this intruder, the two had a struggle, and that resulted in him being shot in the arm and then Heidi accidentally being shot in the back as she was running away. But as they were investigating, there were a lot of things that just did not add up about about this entire scenario. They were in deep financial trouble and they were set to be evicted the literal day that Heidi got shot. Most of her family believed that she was not aware of these financial issues because there were absolutely no signs that they had packed up their house or had any plans to leave. But no one had been charged with breaking and entering and killing poor Heidi and everyone believed that it truly was an intruder for a while. When I originally covered Heidi's case, it was just a theory that Nick was involved. It was just a speculation, but nobody knew the truth. But now, 11 years later, Nick has been arrested and is being charged with second degree murder. In addition to what I mentioned earlier about the financial problems probably being his main motive for killing Heidi, there were other things that made police look more into Nick as their suspect beyond what I originally discussed in the other video. Again, I'm not going to be going over all of the evidence and theories that I already discussed in that video, but I am going to talk through some of the new things that they've discovered since I posted that video. So first, investigators swabbed the gun for DNA, but they could not find any unidentified DNA profiles on the gun. There was also insufficient genetic information from DNA swabbed on the entry door. This makes absolutely zero sense if they really did have this close interaction, this close face-to-face -face struggle that somehow none of this man's DNA got on the shotgun at all. Also, the trajectory of how Heidi was shot did not match up with how Nick described the situation. Then, despite Nick saying that there was this intense struggle just in front of the front door, there was a small table in close proximity that was completely undisturbed. In addition to all of that, a man has come forward saying that he believes that Nick tried to frame him for the murder. So as we know from the previous video, Nick really didn't give a description of what this man looked like at first. It wasn't until two weeks later that he had a private sketch artist come up with a sketch of what this man looked like. This sketch portrayed an African-American male in a hoodie. Turns out this sketch looks strikingly similar to a man named Michael Pye. Now, in the months before Heidi's death, there was a series of break-ins around the same area happening in the mornings when the homeowners were still home, the same type of situation that happened with Heidi. An apparent intruder broke into their home when they were still home in the morning. These robberies were in fact committed by Michael Pye. So of course, police interviewed him right away, but they were quickly able to rule him out because Michael had already been arrested for his break-ins on January 1st, 2010, and Heidi's murder wasn't until April 25th, 2010, so he was already in jail when that happened. After Michael saw this sketch, he is confident that Nick did that on purpose to try and frame him. He's out of jail now and has said that he's taking steps to better his own life, but he said that he's very thankful that he was in jail when this occurred because otherwise he may have been caught up in a murder investigation that he had nothing to do with. Nick was arrested in mid-May of this year and he made his first court appearance a few days later. It was at this time that his bail was set to $3 million 
and as of right now, he has been indicted on these charges. Heidi's family came out and said, quote, we are extremely grateful for all of those who have worked so hard and so long to get this case to this point, and also for everyone who has prayed and stood beside us all of these years. We are hopeful that these charges will finally bring out the truth and result in justice for Heidi. Even though we can't have her back, we believe Heidi would want us to have the truth. God is honored by truth. Heidi's life and memory is further honored by truth. So things are looking really good in Heidi's case, and I really do think that we're finally going to see some justice for Heidi. So the next case update I have is on Rita Gutierrez Garcia. Now, her case was one of the very early videos that I did on my channel, so one of the first videos that I ever did. So if you do go back and watch that video, please be kind. I look completely different probably by now, but that's not what's important here. But either way, seeing some movement on a case that I covered so long ago is just so amazing to me. So to recap her case, in 2018 on St. Patrick's Day, Rita and a couple of friends decided to go out on the town to celebrate the holiday. They ended up just all walking around and bar hopping, having a good time. They ended their night at a bar called Three's Bar in Longmont, Colorado at around 2 a.m. This bar is where all of the friends parked their cars at the beginning of the night, so all of the friends went back to their cars to drive home, but Rita actually stayed back telling her friends that she was going to be getting a ride from a friend. But unfortunately after this, she was never seen or heard from ever again. Several months after her disappearance, police announced that they were looking into a man named Juan Jose Figura. He was believed to have been the last person that she was seen with and they had some sort of forensic evidence that connected him to her. But other than that, the two weren't really friends and they didn't have any connections that we know of. But he did have a very, very violent criminal history, which included domestic violence, animal cruelty, theft, and violent sexual assault. So at this time, Juan is actually serving time for a sexual assault from 2017. He was actually arrested back in March of 2018 when he was caught entering the U.S. at the U.S.-Mexico border, which I will explain in just a second. But either way, while he's been in jail, police have not stopped investigating him. They looked into his phone history, his social media, and and they wiretapped his phone calls. So they found out that Rita's phone actually last pinged near the 600 block of Main Street and Kaufman Street between 2.40 a.m. and 3.03 a.m. the night that she went missing. Well, security cameras picked up Juan's car around the same area at 3.03 a.m. Four minutes later, there were two hang-up calls to 911 from Rita's cell phone before her cell phone completely dropped signal at 3.10 a.m. Then, as we just discussed, a few days after the disappearance, Juan was caught re entering the U.S. at the U.S.-Mexico border, meaning that he had left the country just a few days after a woman that he had connections with went missing. Well, it turned out that while he was in Mexico, he had asked several people for money, telling them that he was in trouble and that he planned on selling his truck. Also, apparently, Juan was caught telling a cellmate while he was in jail that after he picked up Rita, she called him a weirdo, which he was very, very offended by, and because of that, he punched her so hard that she fell unconscious. Conscious. He said that after that, he strangled Rita and then went and hid her body in an area that is not accessible to the public and then burned her clothes in his sister's fireplace. He was also heard saying that he burned his own clothes and he extensively cleaned his truck. However, despite him cleaning his truck the best that he could, the police were able to obtain a DNA sample on the fabric in the passenger seat of the truck and upon testing, it was consistent with Rita's DNA. Then police heard something very interesting on a phone call that they wiretapped. I'm not sure exactly who he was talking to, but the last thing he said on this phone call was that the only way police were going to find out where he hid Rita's body is if they stuck a probe in his brain. So three years after her disappearance, he was subsequently charged with three counts of first degree murder after deliberation, first degree felony murder, and second degree kidnapping. Her her body has not yet been found, but police have said that they believe she's no longer alive. But they did say that her body not being found is the reason that this case had dragged on for so long. But this is a huge step in Rita's case, and Rita's family is so happy to finally see someone taking responsibility for her murder. Rita's sister, Jessica Reyes, came out and said, quote, I never doubted you guys. I never doubted you, speaking on the police. And I always knew that we would reach our moment of victory. I know this is 
just the beginning, but we're on our way, and I just want everyone not to forget Rita. Remember her more than anything, and not as a victim, but she will be victorious. Longmont police are still offering a reward of $10,000 for help in finding Rita's body. They are still hoping that someone who is out there who knows what happened will come forward with what they know. But for now, we can at least find comfort in knowing that there is someone being held responsible for her murder. The next update isn't really an update, but I felt like this was a very good time to talk about this. So this is in relation to Thomas Jodry's case. Just as a reminder, Thomas Jodry fell from a parking garage after drinking. He was with a man named David Knight, who is a known sex offender. The reason that these two were together in the first place was basically as a business meetup where David promised Tommy that he was going to help his cactus business by taking photos for him. Well, after Thomas fell from that parking garage, David showed some very strange behaviors and his story about what happened that night just kept changing. As of right now, Tommy's death is not considered suspicious by police, but many people, including his family, believe that David Knight knows a lot more about what really happened than what he's letting on. After I posted the original video, I had a friend of the Jodry family reach out to me and ask me to share photos with you guys of a bunch of different people who were known to be around the area that night. The family is relying heavily on help from the public and is asking anybody who saw him that night to come forward with what you know. I did link these photos to a comment under the original video, but in case you didn't catch that, I will be posting them here again. I will also be showing you some of these photos now, as well as their descriptions that the Dodri family has on their website. Again, all of these photos are of people that are known to have been in the area around Tommy when he died that night. So if you know any of the people in these photos, or if you are any of the people in these photos, the family is begging you to come forward with what you know about that night. So the first picture is of David Knight. This next picture is of a man kneeling next to Tommy after he fell. This same kind man was speaking to police and telling them what happened. The family says that they really need to hear from you. This picture is a woman who stayed with Tommy after he fell. It says that she wanted to speak with police, so the family is asking that you please call them. This man was with the woman in the previous photo. They said that this man came over from across the street when the incident happened. So this photo shows Tommy and Dave in the Frog and Peach bar. At the time this photo was taken, David Knight had just pulled Thomas's head down to his crotch by the bill of his hat. The bartender had heard a crass remark and so did the other men seen in this photo. They said that Tommy appears to be smiling, but he's actually grimacing. They asked that the bystanders in this photo come forward with what they heard him say. All of these photos are of people that the family needs to get into contact with. So again, if you recognize anybody in these photos or if you are any of the people in these photos, please, please come forward and speak with the family. Their website will be linked below, and once you get to their website, there's a very obvious button that says contact us from the front page. They have made it very, very easy to get a hold of them if you have absolutely any information, so if you do have any information, please get into contact with them. So those are pretty much all of the case updates that I have for you guys right now. It's really exciting seeing some movement happening in these cases that I've talked about over the past few years. When I read researched this video, I did go through and try and look up pretty much every case that I've covered this far to see if there were any other updates that I didn't know about, but as far as I saw, these really are the only significant updates that I can find. But if you do know of any updates on cases that I've covered that I've missed, please go ahead and let us know in the comments so we can be aware of those. I was really hoping to find updates on the Maya Maletti case or the case of Matthew and Philip Reagan. Those are two cases that I really thought we were going to get a lot more answers a lot quicker, but unfortunately, I don't have any updates with those cases right now. But yeah, that is all I have for you guys today. I really hope you enjoyed hearing all of these different case updates, and make sure you stay tuned for more case updates in the future. And make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter to keep up to date with smaller case updates as they come out. If you liked this video and you want to see more case updates in the future, make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up. And again, make sure to comment below if you know any other case updates that I didn't mention in this video. Make sure you go ahead and subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss a future video. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions for me, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!